All right, uh, welcome everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful KubeCon so far. And uh, it's the last day, so thanks for dropping by before you head home. <laughs> So uh, today, um, there are going to be two of us. Uh, I'm Deep from Apple, and my co-speaker is Feng from Databricks. And we'll be talking about, so what if I don't want my persistent storage to be yet another bind mount? So here's a quick introduction to our talk. Uh, first, we'll start off with describing how the current lifecycle and flow of events work for pods that mount persistent storage. We'll go over some of the key assumptions that are there in the kubelet as well as container runtimes around how volume mounts are set up for pods that do mount persistent storage. Next, we are going to go over some of the typical bind mounts that take place as part of surfacing persistent storage to pods today. After that, we are going to go over some of the alternatives to the standard flow for mounting persistent storage into pods. We'll look at this alternative mainly from the perspective of alternative runtimes to run C, such as micro VMs, specifically Kata. We'll also go over some of the challenges that arise when some of the base assumptions in kubelet and the container runtime are no longer true. Finally, uh, we'll be going over some of the enhancements that uh, we have implemented in CSI plugins to basically surface this alternate flow, which we call the direct assignment model we have initially prototyped it with, uh, by adding a fair amount of awareness around Kubernetes and Kata runtime within the CSI plugin. And we'll go over a future direction where we're exploring a cap to make this support a lot more generic so that the CSI plugins do not need to be aware of the fact that they're operating within a Kubernetes framework or that the end runtime is actually Kata. And finally, we'll be concluding with some takeaways and how you can contribute to this overall effort. So let's start all the way at the beginning and look at how a pod comes to life from the perspective of the kubelet. So typically, you either have a pod being submitted by kubectl or a workload controller such as stateful set. And once the pod gets submitted, it gets created in the API server the cube scheduler picks up the pod and picks the most ideal node in the cluster that the pod should get scheduled to. Once the node name is set by the scheduler, the kubelet on that designated node picks up the pod and starts to process it and bring it to life. One of the first things that the kubelet starts processing is the volume section of the pod. So there are two main categories of volumes that pods can mount in Kubernetes. The first kind are the inline volumes, and they mainly present ephemeral data to the pods. And this includes things like config map or secret, which are typically powered by a piece of code that's already within the kubelet itself, because they are so common and pervasive. However, ephemeral volumes may also be backed by specialized CSI plugin in case you have a very specific secret store. And in that case, uh, the kubelet works with the specific backend through a CSI, CSI plugin. The more common category and the focus of our talk here are volumes that are backed by persistent volumes, which are bound to objects called persistent volume claims, which are actually what is specified in the pod spec. Now, persistent volumes can be backed by a variety of different storage backends. So it could be, say, EBS in case of uh, the AWS cloud, or GCPD in case of uh, the GCP environment, or your own SAN environment in case of uh, on-prem setup. Now, the kubelet, it's impossible for it to know how exactly to discover these various storage backends and how to mount the volume from these backends. So for doing that, it depends on plugins associated with these backends that are shipped by individual vendors and installed on specific nodes, and these are called CSI node plugins. So by utilizing a CSI node plugin, the kubelet is able to discover a storage, a piece of storage that's attached to a node and then uh, instruct the node plugin to get the volume prepared so that it can be mounted in an appropriate location from which, from which point onwards the kubelet can start processing it. Now, once the file system on the volume has been mounted, the kubelet executes a bunch of very important uh, actions. Specifically, the first one involves looking at the FS group specification in the pod 
and applying it based on what is called the FS group change policy. Now, what is the FS group? FS group is essentially a supplemental group ID that a pod may specify so that different pods that run with different user IDs can share the data on the same persistent volume. In older versions of Kubernetes, the kubelet would sort of blindly mount a volume, look at the FS group, and do a recursive file system traversal through the entire volume to apply the group ownership. In more recent versions of Kubernetes, there's the new FS group change policy called on route mismatch that allows this process to be a lot more optimized. And so in this mode, the kubelet just looks at the top level directory, sees if it's owned by the right supplemental group ID that's specified as the FS group. And if so, it just doesn't, it skips the entire file system traversal. Next up, containers within a pod may wish to not mount the whole volume, but only a part of the volume. So these are defined as subpaths, and the kubelet needs to make sure that the subpath is safe and secure, and the pod is not a malicious one trying to escape out of the pod sandbox by specifying relative paths with a string of, say, dot, dot, slashes. Uh, there have been some vulnerabilities associated with this, and therefore it's quite important that the kubelet probes the subpath, ensures it's safe, and then locks it in a position so that it does not change between the evaluation time and when the containers actually are brought up. And then finally, if SE Linux is enabled on the node in enforcing mode, the kubelet needs to figure that out and make sure that if uh, SE Linux label has been explicitly specified, that label gets passed down to the container runtime and applied on the entire file system tree so the right SLNX labeling is, um, is, is provided to the files and directories so that containers within the pod can read the files and directories. If SLNX label is not specified, uh, kubelet still instructs the container runtime to go ahead with SLNX labeling, but figure out the SLNX label at runtime dynamically allocated by the container runtime. So once the file system mounts are ready, the kubelet moves on to the next phase, which is invoking a CRI implementation, typically container D or Creo, and which in turn goes on to invoke a lower layer, a lower level container runtime, such as RunC or Kata, to create the pod sandbox environment, which could be just a bunch of namespaces in case of RunC or a micro VM in case of Kata, pull down the container images and create the individual containers specified within the pod. As part of the first step, one of the other things that a CRI implementation would typically do is interact with the CNI plugin to also set up networking for the pod sandbox. Now, once the pod and the containers are up, it's not like the job around file system operations is not quite done. Throughout the pod's lifetime, there could be other volume management operations that, are, that need to be executed by the kubelet. So specifically, there are Prometheus metrics around file system stats for the volumes that are mounted, and the kubelet needs to basically query the file system stats for all the volumes through the corresponding CSI node plugin to report these up. Also, the administrator may wish to expand a persistent volume, in which case the kubelet again needs to work with the appropriate CSI node plugin to ensure the mounted file system is expanded and the right files and the right uh, backing size is reflected on the file system mount. So here's kind of like a complete picture of how all of this fits in together. So again, just to recap, at the very left, we have the kubelet talking to a CSI node plugin to first discover the backing storage and then get it mounted with a specific file system onto what's called a global mount path. This typically happens as part of a CSI API called CSI node stage volume. Next, this global mount path gets bind mounted to a pod specific mount path as part of a CSI node publish volume API. And finally, the kubelet works with the CRI container runtime and a lower level runtime handler like runc to prepare the pod sandbox environment and bind mount the pod path into the mount namespace of the, of the, spot, of the pod sandbox. So the key thing to notice here is that there were a couple of bind mounts that were going on as part of the entire setup. First, there was the bind mount from the global path to the pod-specific path, and from the pod-specific path to a path inside the container. 
And again, to recap, um, one of the things we saw is that all the, the kubelet assumed that all the file systems for all the volumes are fully mounted before it went on to the container bring up stage. This is important because the kubelet, as well as the container runtime, makes these assumptions because it needs to execute the following three actions on the file system mount. So that again is applying the FS group settings, making sure the subpaths are sanitized and probed, and finally applying the appropriate SLinux labels. Now, while this sequence is very standardized and it works across the board, can we have a different sequence? Specifically, how about a model where we decide to mount the volumes after the containers are brought up? And we want to do it without using the raw block mode that's available in Kubernetes today. We want to continue to use persistent volumes that specify a file system mode. And a specific use case of this is micro VM environments, specifically like Kata. And to describe this in a lot more details, I'll switch over to my co-speaker, Feng. Thank you, Deep. Next, uh, talk about how do we mount a PV in a micro VM based runtime. So micro VM based container runtime is a category of runtime that runs the container workload in a virtual machine. Typical examples include Kata containers and file cracker. Compared to traditional container runtime that's based on Linux namespace and C group, such as run C, the Kata containers pro, uh, provides better workload isolation and much better security, which is really important for use cases uh, such as multi-tenant workload in one cluster. It's also more lightweight compared to a full-blown virtual machine. For example, Kata containers has made optimizations to improve the startup time and reduce the memory footprint. Kata containers is also fully compliant to the OSI container format and then the container D cryo interface. So users don't need to change the application to migrate from a run C container to a Kata container. So a quick recap of the architecture of Kata containers. Kata containers interact, integrate with CI container runtime such as uh, container D and cryo through, a shim, through the shim interface. So under the hood, Kata shim translates OCI spec to a set of uh, VM spec and launch a virtual machine through the hypervisors such as Kimu and Cloud Hypervisor. And inside the guest VM, there's also an agent called the color agent. The color shim can interact with the color agent through a TT uh, vSocket socket, socket, socket using TTRPC protocol. The agent is responsible for managing the container lifecycle inside the guest VM. The color shim also translate, uh, connect the IO stream between the CI runtime, such as container D, with the container inside the guest through the uh, TDRPC protocol. So uh, how do we mount a volume in Kata container? A traditional way is very similar to what Deep just described. The CSI will prepare the volume, will by mount the volume to the per pod mount, and then the Kata shim will do the magic. It will actually by mount again the per pod mount to a shared location, and then the shared directory is then shared to the guest through a shell file system called vertiofs. So this approach is very straightforward. It works out of the box, but it does come with a few trade-offs. First is the performance. But our FS has a much worse performance compared to a power virtualized block device such as with our BLK and with our SCSI. It also sacrificed the isolation because now you need to mount a file system on the host. There are also other gaps existing with our FS. It doesn't implement all the features that exist in a native file system such as open by handle at. So we actually did some micro benchmark using the FIO. As you can see, uh, compared to the VLBLK with SPDK as the data plane, 
the LFS has much worse performance in the random write and random read. The, ran the sequential write is similar. The sequential read is actually faster, so I think this is largely due to the caching and, and the, the prefetching. So because of this uh, caveat, we explore an alternative approach, which is to delegate the PV mount and preparation to the container runtime inside the guest. We call it the direct assigned storage. So the main difference here is instead of relying on VLFS, the color shim will actually attach the block device to the guest through the VLBLK. And then inside the guest, uh, the agent will handle the mount and, and the, file, the preparation. So here is a much more detailed view of the sequence. So to, to, when create a volume, the Kubernetes will call the node publish volume. And then the CSI, CSI driver plugin instead will invoke a new command line we imp implement in color runtime called the direct volume add and pass the mount information to the color runtime. The color runtime then persists the mount information on the disk. So when the color shim is ready to start the pod sandbox, it will read this uh, mount information from the file, then it will pass this information to the color agent. Uh, before that, it actually first it will attach the virtual BLK device to the hypervisor first. And then the color agent will uh, mount FLS, FS by mount the volume to the container and finish the whole process. So the arm mount is actually simpler. When the pod is gone, all the mount will be destroyed inside the guest. So on the host, the only thing left is basically the mount info file. So when the Kubernetes called the node unpublish, the CSI drive plugin will basically just invoke the direct volume remove uh, CLI. The color runtime just remove the mount info file. So with this approach, we also implement the uh, volume stats. So the CSI plugin can invoke direct volume stats. The color runtime then send a TDRPC request to the color agent. The color agent then collect returned volume stats back to the runtime and to the CSI driver plugin. Similarly, to resize the volume, the CSI plugin can invoke the direct volume resize and then the cut runtime will first resize the block device through the hypervisor, assuming the hypervisor is supporting this feature, and then send the TDRPC request to the color agent to, to resize the volume, which the color agent just refresh the file system metadata. So next, I'll just do a quick demo, a live demo. So, uh, I already have a YAML file here. So this YAML file it has basically has a very as a container. Then it has two volumes. One is the CSI volume, which used the uh, direct assigned storage. The other is the VLFS volume. We also implement our own um, the storage class and the PVC, and we can skip those. So I uh, apply this uh, YAML file. Okay, let's wait a couple more seconds. Okay, it's already running. So we can exact into the exact into the pod. So now we are inside the container in a guest VM. We can do a, a mount. We, we can show all the mount. You can see here there's a virtual BLK volume, which is a mount to slash dev slash VDC. That's the virtual BLK device that's attached to the VM. And then the type is ext4. That's what we designed a native file system. And then there's also this virtual FS volume, so this is, has type with our FS, so this is shelled from the host. 
So we can also uh, log into the node to take a look at the mount info file. So the mount info file is stored in a Kata container directory under the run Kata container shell. So the name is basically the path uh, encoded with base64. You can take a look at the mount info. So it's very simple. It only ha it, right now it have the device, it have the FS type. There are also a few other options we support, such as like the um, how the change in the user of the uh, FS owners. So this is basically a vhost uh, user block device. So that's the demo. So the current approach uh, it, uh, requires a specific uh, CSI implementation. There's no change in Kubelet, CI, CI, OCI, or CSI specs. And most of the post mount configuration works, but there are also a few uh, drawbacks right now. For example, the subpass support is not uh, supported right now. The CSI plugin also need to be customized and need to be aware of the runtime class. So next, deep, we'll talk, uh, uh, talk about a future direction that can make this more generic. Great, thanks a lot, Feng, for the wonderful demo. So let's look at uh, how the future of this would look like. So we are basically exploring a Kubernetes enhancement proposal, specifically 2857 upstream with mainly SIG storage with a little bit of SIG node involvement as well to address some of the limitations Feng just went over. So the idea there is can we enhance the kubelet, the runtime class, and the CSI spec in a way that allows, first of all, the kubelet to pass down all the necessary parameters around post-mount configuration down to the CSI plugin, and basically not have the CSI plugin need to do a kube API server lookup. That'll help solve uh, one of the negatives. The other is, one of the other feedbacks have been like, if the runtime class that's already there to specify uh, the, the micro VM runtime details, can that be enhanced to have fields that allows the runtime to basically advertise to Kubelet that, hey, I am capable of doing this file system mounting and delegation from a CSI plugin. So the Kubelet will essentially be enhanced to look up and match the capabilities of the runtime with that of the CSI plugin. And if all the capabilities of the pod spec match the capabilities of the plugin and the runtime around all kinds of mount and post mount configuration, Kubelet will basically automatically ask the CSI plugin to perform the delegation of the file system mount and the post mount operations. And one of the final aspects of this enhancement will be that all, we want all post mount configurations to be supported, including things such as subpath handling. There are a couple of gotchas though. Uh, one is if you have scenarios where there are multiple pods that are associated with the affinity relationship that get scheduled on the same node and try to mount the same volume, then there might be a problem. So the standard access mode of read write once on PVCs may not be safe in such scenarios, especially if, you, if you're using a standard file system like XFS or exe 4 there will be file system corruption because the same file system will get mounted by multiple pods at the same time. To work against that, what we are recommending as part of the enhancement is to use a new CSI access mode that has been recently introduced called read write once pod. Typically, in our experience, most pods do not have affinity relationship, and this should just work out, but just uh, wanted to call this out. The other interesting scenario to consider is that uh, if the mounting of the volume requests a secret, then it's not recommended to use this approach because the mount info.json file that Feng was going over, that contains all the mount options that are necessary and we do not want a secret to be persisted in the OS disk. We also considered some other alternatives on how we can potentially get this going. So one question that came up is, uh, how about enhancing CRI and OCI uh, 
and basically all the CRI runtimes and OCI runtimes as well to plumb this storage support all the way through. The main, the, the main limitation we ran into is that storage primitives are more or less absent in the runtime interfaces today. And there are no ways or no like API uh, primitives today through which uh, mounted file systems stats can be queried on a pod that is already running. It's also impossible to say, you know, resize this volume that is mounted by a pod. However, this could be a much longer term effort once the runtime interfaces are made a little broader and uh, some scenarios like this becomes part of the set of problems they are trying to address. So to quick, a uh, quick recap of the takeaways, we mainly explored an alternative to the standard mount workflow for persistent storage. We mainly looked at it from a micro VM perspective, specifically Kata. Uh, we went over how exactly the delegation of mount post mount configuration and obtaining uh, stats and resizing of file systems would work through a container runtime handler. We mainly looked at it from the perspective of block-based PVs, and the key thing we avoided is mounting the file system in the host and avoided all the associated bind mounts and file system projections through things like Vorta AOFS. We would love to get your involvement and feedback, so feel free to reach out either through the KEP process, which is KEP 2857, and you can reach us in the six story Slack channel in Kubernetes as well as in the Kata community Slack. Thanks a lot. That was our presentation. Any questions? Awesome. Thanks for the demo. Um, just had a question around the usage of block storage versus file storage. So the, in, in the demo, I'm assuming it was using a block device. And that's how we were avoiding this kubelet interaction of by mounting. Um, but in, in the cap, is that a proposal to allow for delegation? I just wanted to clarify that point. Or would users of this feature still have to use block devices? So um, in the cap from the SIG storage community, there's a bit of hesitance to open it up to network file like NFS scenarios as well as block. Um, their recommendation is to start off at the alpha stage, at least with just block, mm -hmm. and then move over to uh, shared file systems. However, with the approach that Feng went over, there's nothing that prevents you from just you know, applying the same mechanism to NFS or SMB as well. Um, essentially, the entire mount will take place within the micro VM environment, and kubelet will just be skipping both of the blocks. Got it, okay. So does that kind of limit the user's configuration then if they're unable to kind of pass through some of the other semantics of a file system in their storage class? And I guess it's kind of dependent on like having another way to pass information to your CSI driver? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, it. It's mainly file system information from the CSI plugin to the container runtime handler. Hmm. Okay. And the idea is like storage class parameters should already get passed down to the plugin through kubelet, through existing means. Cool. Any other questions? All right, going once, twice, that's it. So before we wrap, uh, I also want to recognize a lot of contributions into this effort from Ibo Zhuang and Eric Ernst, both of who are here. So thanks a lot, guys. 